Chapter 16 As he stared out at the field by his house, Jason wondered how long it would take for his friends to arrive. Not long, he hoped. He was ready. He'd been ready for a long time. It was a little after six in the evening, but it felt much later. The sky was very cloudy. He knew why it was undeniably dark in this town. They were here, and they wanted the orb. But they weren't going to get it. Not if Jason could help it. Soon his followers would be here. He had already sent out the signal for them to follow, though on a low bandwidth that he knew the unwanted visitors from above wouldn't be able to detect. As Jason waited, he decided to check on him. He walked through the spacious farmhouse, which looked similar to Owen's, until he was standing just outside a room near the rear. He opened the door slowly and saw Michael lying in a bed against the far wall. Jason shook his head sadly. Though it was very dark in the room, he could see his younger brother perfectly and wished he couldn't. The encounter they'd had with Owen and his friend at the garage downtown had taken a terrible toll on Michael. Jason looked in a corner of the room and saw an axe and a sword leaning against the wall. They made him smile. Michael had stolen them from Les Huntington. Jason knew his brother loved sharp, exotic weapons, his large curved knife being his prized possession. Michael had killed David Hernandez with it. As much as Jason loved his brother, he knew there was really nothing he could do for him. Looking at him now in this condition reminded Jason of what had happened two years ago when Michael, who was sixteen at the time, told Jason of the ship he'd found in a field. A bona fide spaceship. And it had appeared out of nowhere. So Jason followed to check it out. There, they had found the spherical ship, just like Michael had said. What they'd found inside a jar in the ship, however, changed their lives. There was a noise coming from outside the room. Jason looked down the hall and saw someone standing on the porch, staring through the screen door. It was a young man with a black hoodie and jeans, with long, greasy brown hair in front of his pale face. Jason recognized him. Making his way slowly down the hall and passing the robot D in the living room, Jason opened the screen door and noticed, but was not surprised by, the large number of people standing in his yard. There had to be at least fifty people, and they stood silently, staring up at him. His minions were finally here. Some were the walking dead, others just victims of the leech venom and this was only a fraction of them. Jason looked back at the one on the porch with him. There were dark tear tracks running from his eyes past his cheeks, and though Jason had never officially met the boy before now, he knew him to be Chris. He knew because Michael had known. This was the boy responsible for Michael's condition. He was the one who had thrown that weird bomb that caused the garage to collapse while the orb was sending its signal, putting Michael into the coma. Jason wanted nothing more than to reach out and snap Chris's neck, because Chris was one of the venom-infected zombies. But no, he'd do much worse to the boy. Jason was going to make Chris his slave and make him do evil things, things he and Owen and the others swore to prevent with their little club the unstoppable titans. They're not so unstoppable, after all, he thought. Ever since Michael had extracted the information about the orb from Owen's head, Jason had had the luxury of viewing some of Owen's thoughts at leisure. Right now, he was thinking about all of the softball games Owen and Chris had played together. But they would never play again. Not after today. Jason placed his hand on Chris's throat and slowly squeezed it. Chris started to sputter, and his face turned red and then blue. But he didn't fight Jason in the slightest. Jason finally grabbed control of his anger and released the boy. He placed his hand on Chris's shoulder and led him down the steps to the grass. 
Despite his anger over what Chris did to Michael, Jason just couldn't bring himself to kill the monster hunter. Not yet, anyway. As they walked to the yard, Jason could see more people wandering off the road in front of the house. Everyone who stood before him shared the blank, pale face of Chris himself. Jason knew why that was, and it made him angry. The leeches were attacking people at random now that the orb had been activated, and that's not what they were supposed to do. Jason looked down at the orb in his hand. The glow in its center was very faint now. It needed recharging, and for that, he would need a leech. He looked at Chris standing next to him and said, Go find me a leech and bring it back here. Don't kill it, and be swift about it. Chris took off across the field, past the growing crowd of zombies, and ran full speed down the dirt road. Jason marveled at how fast he was moving, and instead of taking joy in his minions' abilities, he feared them. That was a side effect of the venom of the leech, and he knew he would have to work on that. The venom that powered the orb was only supposed to act as a brain-paralyzing agent, but for some reason... It also gave anyone caught in its wave the strength of the leech as well. Jason knew how dangerous that made his minions. If they ever decided to turn against him, they would be able to take him out with no trouble at all, especially since the orb was running on empty right now. After a while, he wouldn't be able to control his followers, and there was no telling what they would do without guidance. They were getting closer according to the tracker in Doug's lap. They were driving down a dirt road about twenty minutes from the Matthews place. We're lost, Curtis said for the tenth time. We're not lost, Doug said, not taking his eyes off the screen. We're almost there. How accurate is that thing? Curtis asked, looking around. There was a wooded area on his left and an open field on his right with another wooded area beyond that. My brother built it, Doug said, so it's very accurate. Curtis said no more. Something didn't feel right, though. And then he saw, with the very little light they were getting from the sky, a huge footprint in the field. And then another. They were going in the same direction. Silver, Curtis whispered. Where? Doug asked, jumping in his seat and looking around furiously. Not here, Curtis answered, shaking his head at his jumpy companion. He went through here, though. Look. He pointed to the craters in the field. Silver had abruptly left the street where Owen had reclaimed the orb, and Curtis figured the giant had gone after him. So if Silver was here, so was Owen. But what was Curtis going to do when he found Owen? He wasn't sure. Perhaps they could stop fighting and figure out what to do together, like Doug had suggested. Curtis wanted to believe that was possible. He had to believe it. What time is it? Curtis asked, not taking his eyes off the field. Nearly seven o'clock? Doug answered, looking at his watch. Is that it? Is that his house? Curtis was looking at a two-story house coming up on their right. Doug looked down at the tracker, then shook his head. The signal was coming from farther away than this. Keep going. So Curtis kept driving. The crowd parted to let them through. There was a lot of thrashing coming from the dark creature as Chris dragged it to the front. Jason grinned as he walked down the steps from the porch to meet them. The leech was being dragged in a fierce headlock and was letting out loud gagging noises. Jason's grin faded. Chris didn't have a scratch on him, but the leech itself looked beaten up. Jason hadn't expected that. He walked up to the snarling creature before him, the orb in his right hand. Chris held the monster down on its knees. This was the first one Jason had ever seen with his own eyes. He had memories of it, but they weren't his memories. He knew there were only ten of them, 
the ones Arminus brought with him to do his experiments, so he would have to use this one carefully. That would be difficult, though. Sifting through Owen's memories, Jason knew that the unstoppable titans had killed almost all of these precious leeches so far, and using the unstable link he had with Owen, he was able to see what the boy had seen every now and then. Jason knew three more leeches were dead, one at Birch Plaza and two at the Matthews house. Without their venom, the orb would be useless. Jason touched the creature's bald scalp with the tips of his fingers, then worked down to its chest. The creature stopped struggling and stared at Jason with its big yellow eyes. It looked almost like a child now. And why not? They had been children when Arminus had experimented on them. And then it screamed as Jason thrust his hand into its stomach and pulled out something small and pale. It was the venom gland. He put it in the crook of his arm. Then he dug into its chest and pulled out its heart. The heart was red and beating, and it looked so much like a human heart. Though he knew it was just an animal as Arminus knew it, Jason's human self couldn't get past the shock of what he had just done. Then, suddenly, the leech melted away in Chris's grip, splattering to the ground in a smelly dark slush. Jason turned back to the house, carrying the gland in one hand and the orb in the other. A few moments later, Jason was ready. He sat down at the desk in the study with a cup full of venom he'd extracted from the gland. The fluid looked like liquid gold and was pleasing to his eyes. He set the orb on the desk and slowly poured the venom onto the shiny marble surface. As soon as it touched the orb, the surface immediately went from solid to liquid, yet it retained its spherical shape. Jason smiled at the miracle that was Arminus's powerful weapon. The venom gathered in the center of the suspended liquid shape and swirled around counterclockwise. It reminded him of water circling a drain, only it was beautiful. The orb began to glow white, the light filling the entire study and Jason's widening eyes. Doug was seeing it, but he was having trouble believing it. Curtis had parked a few yards away from a farmhouse where the tracking signal appeared to be coming from. What they found was a mass gathering of people, and not just normal people. Curtis and Doug had been watching for at least ten minutes, and the people in front of the house hadn't moved an inch. It's the zombies, Curtis said. I'm telling you, it's them. But what are they doing? Doug asked. Curtis was silent for a long moment. Then he said, They're waiting. For what? For orders, Curtis whispered. They're waiting to be told what to do. A silent minute passed between them as they sat and watched from a relatively safe distance the strange events unfolding. Earlier, through some binoculars they'd found in the back seat, they had seen a blonde guy come out of the house and approach the growing crowd. What he did beyond that was a mystery because the zombies blocked them. What Doug and Curtis knew for certain, though, was that this guy had the orb. They had seen him carrying it with him. After a few minutes' discussion, they came to figure the guy was Michael's brother, Jason. And then they saw Jason going back into the house, leaving the crowd standing silently in the yard. What do you think happened to Owen? Doug asked. You think he's in the house? He has to be, Curtis said. He took the backpack. He has those tracking things. What do we do? Doug asked. We go in there and rescue him, of course. And get the orb back, Doug added carefully. Yep. Funny, you wouldn't think Owen would need rescuing, Doug said. Something must have happened, Curtis frowned. An uneasy thought just occurred to him. You don't think he brought the orb to Jason, do you? What, like they're working together? Doug shook his head vigorously. No way. 
he wouldn't do that. Those guys killed his friends. They killed your friend. They killed my brother. It was just the thought, Curtis said defensively. Why is Owen here, though? Maybe this is his house, Doug said. Maybe Jason ambushed him here. A whole lot of maybes, Curtis mused. Then he hopped out of the truck and ran to the other side of the road. Doug saw him dip his fingers into some mud and draw tracks on his cheeks, leading from his eyes. What are you doing? Doug asked. I'm trying to look like the zombies. Why? Dude, use your brain. We're going to join the crowd, then sneak into the house and get Owen. And the orb. We? Curtis sighed. You want to stay in the truck? Doug was silent for a while, thinking what he wanted to do. He didn't want to go anywhere near the zombies after his experiences with Owen's friend Chris in the plaza and Daniel at Les's house. But there was a chance Owen was in danger. Plus, the orb couldn't very well stay in Jason's possession. What if the zombies attack us? He asked Curtis. They won't. How do you know? I just do. Doug wasn't completely assured by Curtis's words, but he got out of the truck anyway. He got some mud from his side of the road and marked his face the same way Curtis had done his. They checked each other's work carefully, making sure the mud wasn't too thick. Then they started walking toward the farmhouse slowly, the way they had seen a few zombies do earlier. Crap, I just thought of something. Curtis said quietly, barely moving his lips. You look just like your brother. What if Michael recognizes you? He won't. What makes you so sure? Because Michael's dead. Owen said so. He said he thinks he's dead. Good enough for me. They were only a few feet from the crowd of zombies now. Doug's heart was hammering in his chest. He hoped to God he was right about Michael being dead. Even if he wasn't dead, who's to say Doug and Curtis weren't zombies now? Would the evil brothers care otherwise? This made Doug a little more comfortable as they slowly joined the mass of zombies in the yard. Since they were in the back, Doug and Curtis couldn't see what was going on in the front. The faux zombies glanced sideways at each other, wordlessly contemplating what to do next. They were too afraid to speak. Curtis did a whirly thing with his eyes, which Doug took to mean, Go around the back of the house? Doug responded by scrunching his face slightly, which meant, Maybe. Curtis rolled his eyes in frustration. Doug didn't care. He wasn't the leading type. He would do whatever Curtis planned. He trusted the big guy. Just then, Curtis did something unexpected. He started walking forward through the crowd of zombies. Doug tried to keep his face blank like the others, but inside he was screaming, What the hell are you doing? And then, before he knew it, he was following Curtis through the crowd. He kept his face blank and didn't even risk looking at any of the zombies. None of them seemed to notice anything. They didn't move a muscle as Curtis and Doug pushed past those they couldn't maneuver around. Doug's heart nearly stopped when a little girl zombie fell to the ground after Curtis bumped into her. Now they were near the front, or where Doug liked to think of as the second row. They could see the house perfectly. Someone was there whom he'd recognized. It was Chris. His hair was greasy looking, and he was wearing the black hoodie and jeans. Doug chanced a sideways glance at Curtis, who did the same. He'd noticed Chris, too. Suddenly, the front door opened, and Jason walked out onto the porch. He was wearing a white suit with a cream-blue necktie. He looked much nicer close up than he did through the binoculars. He was holding the orb in his right hand, and the orb itself was glowing fire from its center. Jason stepped off the porch and started pacing back and forth in front of the crowd. All right, minions, he said to them. Here's what I want you to do. We need to get those things out of the ground. 
I want you all to hijack those two giants and use them to retrieve the scepters. Kill anyone who gets in your way. When you're done, bring the giants back here. He stopped pacing right in front of Doug, though he kept surveying his minions. Even though Doug had a zombie between himself and Jason, he didn't feel at all safe. Something was wrong. And then Jason looked right at him. Doug kept his eyes straight and his face blank. Owen had never mentioned whether Jason and Daniel had ever met, but Doug knew without any doubt that Jason recognized him. Jason finally took his eyes off him and addressed the crowd. Do not fail me or I will be very angry. Go now. The zombie crowd turned and began walking in the opposite direction. Doug and Curtis began to follow, the unspoken plan being to split off from the crowd once they were out of Jason's sight and circle back to the house. Before Doug could get a few steps away, he felt a hand on his shoulder. He froze in place. Not you, Jason said. You come with me. With his back to Jason, Doug felt confident enough to fully look at Curtis to see if he knew what was going on. Curtis kept walking, though. He hadn't missed a beat. Doug felt like he was going to throw up as he turned and followed Jason into the house. Since Doug was behind Jason, he let his eyes take in as much of the house as he could. There was electricity, and Doug wondered how that was. If this was Owen's house, then no one had lived here for years, according to Colin. Doug and Jason were passing the staircase and going down a long hallway. Doug's heart lifted when he saw Dee standing in the living room, though his eyes were dark. Apparently, he was powered down. As he and Jason continued down the hall, Doug noticed a table on the left side adorned with pictures. There was an old couple in all of them, with no children in any. Perhaps this wasn't Owen's house after all. There was a dark room at the end of the hall, and Doug thought that was where Jason was leading him, but Jason walked right past it. That didn't stop Doug from looking into the room. For a brief moment, he saw a ghostly figure in the darkness. He couldn't tell what it was. And then the figure moved, and Doug saw that it was a face looking back at him. He quickly looked forward again. What was that? A zombie? Michael? Owen? Jason led Doug to a room just past the kitchen. No good was going to come from this, Doug thought. Jason flipped on a light, and Doug quickly surveyed the room. It looked like a garage, but it was very spacious. There was a tool rack on the far wall, a basketball hoop in the middle, a weight bench in the far corner, and a work table against the wall closest to the entrance where Doug and Jason stood. Jason sat on a stool at the table, never taking his eyes off Doug. A long, horrible silence fell on the garage. Doug continued his zombie performance, concentrating on the tool rack. Jason's gaze was burning a hole in his face, though, and Doug knew it was only a matter of time before he cracked. You know, Jason finally said, when I first saw you outside, I thought I was looking at a ghost. I mean, stranger things have happened, right? He waited for an answer that would not come. Then he said, But Daniel is dead. My brother killed him with his bare hands, so you can't be him. You're alive. What are you, his twin? Doug still didn't answer, though he was getting angry. He didn't want to hear about his brother's final moments from this monster. If he heard any more, he would go insane. Jason spun around on the stool, looking at the ceiling. You know, this scene is very familiar, except my brother was sitting at your brother's work table, and Daniel was standing where you are, the exact same distance away. And you know what Michael did? He smacked your brother clear across the room. He tossed Daniel around like a doll. He had your brother begging for mercy. 
Doug's eyes held back tears as best he could, but sooner or later they would flow and wash away his muddy makeup. Then, to top it all off, he threw Daniel to the floor as hard as he could, causing his insides to explode. How does that make you feel? Doug didn't answer, though he didn't see the point in keeping up the act. Jason clearly knew something was going on. He was just trying to find a way to prove it. Now Jason was looking around the garage for something. And then he seemed to find it because he strode across the room excitedly, like a child running to get his favorite toy. Doug looked sideways to see Jason grabbing the barbell from the weight bench. There were quite a few 45-pound plates on it. Who the hell was this old geezer who lived here? Jason picked up the barbell effortlessly with one hand and brought it back to Doug. If you really are one of my minions, he said, then you shouldn't have any problem holding this for me. Doug knew it was hopeless, but he held his hands out anyway. Jason gently placed the barbell in his waiting hands, and the moment he let go of it, the weight pulled Doug to the ground. As soon as he fell, he started crying. Not because he was in pain, though his arms felt like they had been pulled off. Not because he knew he was going to die now. He cried because he knew there was no way he could avenge his brother's death. No one could. Doug was going to die alone in this garage, and no one would know. Owen wasn't here. Doug knew that now. He could feel it. Jason kneeled down and ran his fingers through Doug's brown hair, as if trying to console him. Why do you cry? he asked quietly. Doug was sobbing so hard he didn't think he could answer. Finally, he said, Why are you doing this? You know, when people found out who my dad was, they tried to kill Michael and me. Does that sound fair to you? The world is unfair. You're making it unfair, Doug spat. How so? You killed my brother, that's how so. I didn't kill him. Then Michael, it doesn't matter. You're taking away everyone's free will and making yourself ruler of the world. Why? Because the world is unfair, Jason repeated. It's unfair while everyone has their freedom, so it only seems logical that once that has been taken away, everything will become fair. For whom? Doug asked practically hysterical. For me, Jason growled, pushing Doug away from him. He walked over to the basketball hoop while Doug wiped his tears from his face. I want to show you I can be just, Jason said as he bounced a basketball in front of him. Join me. No! Jason threw the basketball at Doug. He threw it so hard it was just an orange blur. Doug felt it as it struck his shoulder. He screamed at the sharp pain there. The ball rolled back to Jason, who scooped it up. Doug's vision was fading, but he looked up at his attacker, who was holding the orb in his left hand and the basketball in his right, like he was weighing the two. Last chance, Jason said, looking at his hands. I don't want to kill you. I would say yes, Doug said causing Jason to look up at him. But I'd be lying. Doug grinned. So did Jason, as he threw the basketball right at Doug's head. This time, when the basketball rolled back to Jason, it was covered with blood. It left a red trail on the concrete floor. He didn't bother picking it up. He didn't even look at Doug's body on the ground. He simply walked past it to the door. He had things to do, a world to conquer. Maybe even several worlds, if he was lucky. As soon as he got to the door, though, he was met with a blow to the face. He staggered backward and tripped on the barbell. Gotcha, Curtis said. He was holding his huge fists up in front of him, ready to fight. He nearly dropped them when he saw Doug, blood flowing from his right temple, lying on his side on the floor next to Jason. This was my best shirt, 
Jason said. His white dress shirt was covered with the blood dripping from his nose, which was bleeding freely. He stood up slowly, staring fiercely at Curtis. Curtis raised his fists again, regaining his composure. There was nothing he could do for Doug now except kill Jason. If he could. What if Jason was freakishly strong like the zombies? All his life, Curtis refrained from fighting anyone, always afraid he would seriously hurt his opponent, maybe even kill them. Now he was praying for that outcome. Where's Owen? he asked Jason. I could ask you the same thing. How about your brother? He around? He's indisposed at the moment. Curtis shook his head. Well, I got all I need out of you. He kicked Jason's legs from under him, then laid into his face with punches. Jason didn't fight back. Curtis was overcome by the urge to break Jason. He threw punch after punch, loving the feeling of his skull against his knuckles. He loved the meaty smack every time he hit his face. Why had Curtis always denied himself this joy? And then the answer came to him. He couldn't stop. He'd lost count of the punches he'd delivered. Though Curtis didn't mind it in this case, had this been someone else, they would be dead now. Could Curtis stop if he wanted to? This question nagged him as he continued punching Jason. Stop, a voice inside his head told him. Stop, just to see if you can. But he didn't stop. Jason's head snapped this way and that. He was down on his knees now, bloody and bruised. He's a human being, the voice continued. You can't kill him. Turn him into the police. He killed Doug, another voice said, though it sounded much like the first one. He deserves to die. He'll get what's coming to him, the first voice said. What the hell is this? Curtis asked himself. Two voices in his head were telling him what to do. The voices were his own, he knew. They're my conscience, he realized. I'm not a murderer. I have to stop. And then he did. He stood there, breathless and holding up his bloody, aching fists. His knuckles were bruised. He looked down at Jason, whose head was turned to the left. Curtis couldn't see his face from where he stood. Give him one more, Curtis's bad side whispered. Yeah, one more won't hurt, his good side added. Curtis drew back his fist, then shot it at Jason's exposed right cheek. The punch never connected, though. Jason had grabbed it mid-flight and was clutching it tightly. Curtis felt the bones in his hand breaking. Jason turned his head and glared at Curtis with fiery eyes. His nose was bleeding, and there was faint bruising on his cheekbones, but it was barely noticeable. This has been fun, Jason said as he stood up, but I'm afraid I don't have time for you anymore. Then Curtis felt a sharp pain in his chest as Jason punched him with his free hand. Curtis flew across the garage and through the wall, landing in the kitchen in a heap of plaster and dust. Jason grabbed the orb and walked into the kitchen where Curtis lay, his eyes closed. Feels good to let it out every once in a while, doesn't it? Jason asked. And then he was gone. <laughs>